So you and I were out for a walk some years ago and you were telling me a story <laughs> about one of your jobs that you'd been on. And um, often we're on these stories on these jobs and we can bore one another to tears. But this was an interesting one. It was, thank you. And uh, yeah, you were quite fascinated. You had just returned from Rat Oath where you had been dipping into the story of a cold case murder of mm -hmm. a woman called Una Linsky. Um, this week, the cold case review team have announced that they're going to go and review this murder. But there's a whole pile of shit around it. Oh this God. isn't a simple thing. Yeah. So we'll start maybe at the beginning. Well, the reason I was going was because um, Martin Comey had it just been declared that he had got his case was a miscarriage of justice. And he got an apology, had he? he? Not, no, he only got the apology last year, but um, he, yeah, so he had just got his um, miscarriage of justice and that had taken, as it does, yeah. years and years and years. So it had brought the case up again and um, I was sent out to try and make contact with anyone involved in it that yeah. might give us a chat. Um, Do you know anything about it before? No, I hadn't. No, I didn't know anything about this one because it, it did come up, it has come up over the years. It happened in 1971. Yeah. And, um, it, it, it certainly, there's been a couple of excellent doc, documentaries on it. And, um, but I suppose whenever there's a, a big step in the case like that, you always go back and revisit. Yeah. And I think it's one of those ones that actually probably should be better known than it is. And I think it probably will be, mm -hmm. you know, in the future, because I think it's, it's, it's the start of an era in our justice system that's not particularly pretty. Yeah. And, and that's really people for a long time haven't really wanted to start scratching around there. No, because, I think people have been waiting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're going to go on to talk about the heavy gang, who they were, what sort of things they were doing or have been, you know, alleged to have done. But I suppose at the heart of this story is a young woman who was going about her business one day. Mm. And um, so Una Linsky was 19. Yeah. She lived out in Ratoth on Porterstown Lane, which is there behind kind of um, ferry um, ferry house, house road or, yeah, yeah kind of the race course there so she just got a new job recent job in the civil service and she was getting the bus in and out of Dublin city and um, with a cousin of hers and Gohan who lived on the same road as her so they big used family from big family oh she was one of 12 right yeah she was in the middle somewhere and so that part of me is interest well me is interesting because back in the 50s and 60s the land commission moved a load of families over from Mayo um the land wasn't as good they were struggling to make a living so there was this basically kind of, you know, reconfiguration where they sent them all there and lots and why of... Was, and what was in me? This, it's good for good, grow, grow, for good growing... Good farming land. Cat, yeah. Good farming land. So they're just relocated. Right. Really. So lots of them were, were related. Um, lots of cousins up and down the lane. They all knew each other. Um, and so she and her cousin, Anne Gohan, who lived right beside the bus stop, a few minute walk, uh, they used to get the bus in and out together. So um, it was the 12th of October... At 1971, and they'd got the bus home together, and they got off, and Anne went home, and it, about 15 minutes later, Una should have arrived home. She mm. didn't. Her mother presumed that she'd stopped off in Anne's house. No sign of her. But interestingly, by nine o'clock that night, they'd gone to the guards. Right. So they reported her missing, and because they all knew each other, massive manhunt. And almost mm. immediately, there were witnesses that said they had noticed a strange car in the area. And um, they had noticed that it was a middle-aged man with silver hair, white hair, um, driving it. And they had seen, another witness said that they had seen a woman with shoulder length, dark brown hair, struggling in the back of it with another man. So there were all these witnesses that came forward. So, you know, it looked and suspicious. And to set the scene of 1971, because... Mm. Um, you know, you hear nowadays it was a suspicious car in the area and stuff. I mean, oh, there's yeah. so many bloody cars now. Yeah. But there weren't that many then. No. And also, I think this was an unusual one. It was a Ford Zephyr or a Ford Zodiac or something. Right. Well, there, were, there weren't so many of them. There weren't so many of them. It was a rare enough car. So, they, of course, it, people would have noticed. Yeah, they would. And especially in a, like a community like that, you probably would have known everybody going up and down the mm. road. I mean, they were all related, as you said. They knew what car everyone else yeah. drove. So that sort of witness statement of an unusual car seen in the area and obviously what was seen in it mm. was a massive point of 
you know, a, a focus for the investigation, surely. And probably why it kind of kickstarted it so quickly, because like you hear now that like, oh, they have to be 19 year old girl goes missing. Yeah. You know, like you'd usually wait 24 hours, wouldn't you? They'd yeah. say, ah, they've gone somewhere yeah. else. They don't kind of go in all guns blazing. Mm -hmm. But it did a week later, there was still no trace of her. So they called in a new um, section of the Garda Technical Bureau. Um, it has a name, long name now, but they were nicknamed um, and not by this stage because they were relatively new, but they were nicknamed the Murder Squad mm. and then became known as the Heavy Gang. So these were kind of, they were professional interrogators. So they came down and um, kind of, for some reason, dismissed the witness statements. About this about the car sighting and Silver what Ford. was in it. Yeah, and what was in it. And they instead zoned in on three local lads who... Um, had one of them, Dick Donnelly, had a similar car. It was a Ford, but it was just a different model, but it was also the same colour. And they had been seen in the area as well, but later in the evening, and they would have been in that area because they lived, mm -hmm. you know, in Rathoth. Like it was not unusual that they would have been there at all. So they were Martin Comey, Dick Donnelly and Marty Kerrigan. And um, so they were brought in for questioning. And now these are the allegations that the three men have made since. And these three guys, any history of criminal offending? No, no. It's like they were kind of, they were three local lads. Three local lads. And Marty was only 19. I think Dick Donnelly was maybe 24 and Martin was about 20, 21 at the time. And they, they kind of socialized together. They went to the local pub and there was a no, local nightclub. They were all laboring together. Yeah, yeah. And um, like, they, you know, I think Dick Donnelly ended up marrying Marty Kerrigan's, one of Marty Kerrigan's sisters. Like that's how integrated mm, the, mm. the area was. So no, there was nothing to, there was nothing to kind of like raise suspicions about them at all. No previous. Yeah. yeah. So um, they were brought in and the accounts that each of them well, poor Marty wasn't around to kind of give them, but he told his family about it. But the accounts they have given that what happened to them while in Trim Garda Station were pretty horrific. What sort of stuff have they said? Those well, they were in there for three days. Now, this is 1971. Mm. I, I imagine this was kind of widespread at the time, but they weren't told that they were in custody. They were just told that they'd been brought in for questioning. But as they said themselves, they were such innocents. They, they had no clue about how any of this worked. So they figured they were under arrest and, you know, under suspicion. They were terrified. And um, some of the things that they alleged that happened, for instance, Marty or Martin Comey had... Um, tufts of his hair pulled out from his scalp like he had bald patches by the time he got out, got out of there the guardee said that he had done it to himself because he was so frustrated with their line of questioning um the i went down I, I had been telling you that i'd gone down to meet marty kerrigan's two sisters anne and marie and they told me that their father when their father went in to collect marty from the Garda station and he was a kind of a slight guy. He was a, a smallish kind of guy. He was like cowering underneath the bench, absolutely terrified, crying and just saying to his to father, daddy, I didn't do it. I didn't do it, daddy. Like he was up and they hadn't slept. Right. They didn't leave, let them sleep for three days. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And in the end of the, at the end of that, two of the lads, Martin and Marty ended up signing confessions right. to killing Una. Now, somehow Dick, managed not to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and even the confessions, they were all garbled. They didn't really make much sense. They just said that there had been an incident and they had, uh, you know, decided to hide her body because Una's, poor Una's body wasn't found until two months after she went missing. Right. It was found up in the Dublin mountains, um, which was about 40 kilometres away. She was fully clothed, but she was so decomposed and it was 1971. There was no way of really discerning how she had been mm -hmm. killed. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and then, you know, this had, they had been questioned in the meantime, but had been released and so were out, out, like in their community. Not charged, despite the fact that Not they charged. supposedly confessed. And they had supposedly confessed, but couldn't bring Gardie to the body. No, they couldn't do it. Sure, how could so they have? They were, yeah. Um, like, I think it was a farmer who eventually found um, mm -hmm. poor Una. But um, so in the meantime, and this is kind of important because this is what that sparked or what it did to that community. It was very much split down the middle. There were those who utterly believed that the three lads could have had nothing to do with it. And those who thought, well, maybe it was possible that they did. And there was no smoke without fire. Mm. And they got more and more wild up. And, you know, the, those sisters told of how 
you know, cars would come outside, their ha- drive up and down. Shots were fired over their house of the three lads who were the suspects. Um, you know, slogans were printed outside on the, you know, painted on the pavement on side, side their houses, like murderers, all this kind of thing. And even the Linskys on the other side of it, they got a lot of hostile reaction as well right. for, you know, trying to, you know, even suggest that those three guys, Didn't friends and neighbours, did do it. Oh, did do it. The Linskys, yeah, of course. Yeah. The Linskys started to think, well, how could there, well, and this is the presumption, how could we smoke without any fire? And, and these also were, they were big desperate. detectives coming in from Dublin, from the yeah. murder squad. There was a Definitely a sort of a different attitude. The guards almost had the respect of the church, yeah. you know, the same kind of a thing. And of course, you wouldn't think that they would just possibly pick up three innocents. And, no, but yeah. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. Mm. So two months later, this goes on within the community, divides the community. The community is completely like devastated by it. Cousin against cousin, you know, um, families are destroyed. Friendships are broken forever. So about a week after Una's body has been found, things get really riled up. And there is, um, Marty is in the small, is in the village drinking with friends, basically. And there was a local Garda who spotted them out and he knew that Una Linsky's brother and cousins were out in the town as well. And he offered to drive Marty and his friends um, to the local nightclub. He just thought it would be safer um, for them. So he drove them, but on the way there was an incident, there was a car crash or something. So he had to, he had to head off and do his job, Mm. leaving the lads. And lo and behold, along come the Linsky brothers and, you know, their cousins, there's a fracas, fracas, fight. And they end up bundling poor Marty into their car. And the next, he was found close to the spot where Una's body had been found and he'd been murdered. And in his subsequent murder trial, it was discovered that uh, it, it, he'd been strangled. It was asphyxiation was the, right. was the, um, the, the, but they also found that after he'd been killed, there was a large cut in his, they basically tried to castrate him. And they were later convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to just yeah, three years just three each. Years. So well, they said that they, when they left Marty, that he was still alive. Right. So there wasn't, there wasn't intent to murder that they had left him still alive. So this was like you know, these members of the community had taken it upon themselves to dole out a justice to yeah. a guy they believed was going to get away with the murder of Una Linsky. Well, I, I, tensions I, must have been absolutely. Well, if you can the, imagine, like for two months, they didn't know where she was, yeah. you know, so and then she's eventually found and all the worst affairs dumped in the mountains yeah. somewhere. So they got, the farmer thought she was a sheep. Right. Like she, he thought it was the carcass of a sheep when he right. found it. So she'd been literally thrown in, yeah. onto farmland or sort of some sort of remote yeah. land. And we'll come back to maybe the what sort of may have happened to her in a minute, but continue on the, the, the story. Because this story to me seems to have two elements to it. Firstly, there's the murder of yeah. Alinsky, which the Garda, um, a serious crime review team, are going to try and solve. And they will be looking at the kind of the practicalities of that, any DNA available, um, you know, whether or not they can look at the evidence that was there on those bones and the remains to see if they can come up with, a, yeah. a, you know, a, a cause of death, etc. But there's this whole other side of this story that we're talking about, which is the behaviour really of the Gardaí right. themselves. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, like it wasn't just them. It wasn't the three lads, just the three lads that they brought in. You know, like there were all those witnesses they brought in as well who get, who who told later reporters or made claims later that they had been intimidated into changing their statements as well. You know, like one lad who was brought in. And this is in relation to the murder of Marty or in relation to the murder of murder Una? Murder of Una. Right. So, you know, like it wasn't just the three lads that they brought in and like, you know, that there are allegations of coercion or bullying or right. whatever um like the witnesses as well and 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 a lot of, I remember when I was trying to get in touch with Marty's sisters in the beginning you know and making contact with local reporters or local people I knew whatever and they said oh Jesus that's not something that's people talk about right around yeah. up here because so many people were touched by it you must drag it all back no up again. and like you know that that fear you must feel when you're sitting somewhere and you know what the truth is and you're being told, yeah, well, that's not what we want you to say. And like, what was the sense? Allegedly. How did the community react to John Linsky, James Linsky and John Gochen's sort of trial? I'm not sure. They eventually moved out. The Linsky's moved out. Right. Um, and I think 
from what I, one of the things I read actually is that they, they actually moved her um, grave. Like right. They just disappeared out of the area altogether, you know, because, but interestingly, all the other families stayed there. Yeah. Like poor Dick only died in 2020 and his, um, actually his uh, widow was on um, this week talking about, you know, the importance that a because the only one who got an official apology from the police so far is Martin Comney. Now he got that last year before. That of course is because a year after she was murdered, Unalinsky, Martin Comney and Dick Donnelly were put on trial yes. and convicted of her manslaughter. Yes, and they were also jailed for three years. They were also jailed. obviously Marty was dead, having been killed yeah. by the mob. Yeah, who were serving three years themselves. themselves. Yeah, so yeah. So Marty Martin goes in and he, had, because he had signed that confession, he ends up spending three years in jail. And, you know, some of the interviews that he has given talking about that time in prison, like God loved them, like in the early seventies, like geez, yeah. God knows what was going on. But, and then, but Dick, because he hadn't, was able to get his conviction overturned on appeal. So he was released after about, I think, nine months. Right. So he got out. Um, but both of them, you know, like they talk about their mental health issues, the, the medication that they had to stay on for the rest of their lives, getting fired from jobs years down the line when mm. people recognised their names. They only held on to kind of menial enough work for most of their lives because, you know, all of this had such an effect on them. So, um, and they, but they remain good friends. I suppose you have that link forever, don't you? And then obviously, you know, Dick had gone on to marry um, Marty's older sister, Anne. So, yeah, it, it kind of left behind... It was interesting to me that Murray, I suppose, where else were they going to go maybe as well? And their father, you know, Marty's mother had died when he was very young, only about four or five of cancer. So, you know, there'd been six kids in that family. Um, and I suppose they stayed around to take care of the dad as well. He, Marty's father died when he was 83. Yeah. So how come in 2010, the conviction of Comney was successfully appealed? What sort of... What triggered that? Ba- yeah. It was the Guildford Four. Right. So Martin, um, all his... Martin, I suppose, wanted to get on with things. And then he has talked about this extensively as well. He was watching the Guildford Four being released and it being declared a miscarriage of justice and them talking about their time in prison being kept in for something they didn't do and it triggered something in him. So he decided to pursue his own case. Mm. Now, that's a big thing to do. It's huge. Like, you know, that that the the effort that that would have taken. Yeah. So finally. And you're bringing it all back up oh, again. Yeah. You know, and you're becoming a focus again of a lot of media attention and everything else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all of that. And so, um, yeah, so about t- 2010, it's, you know, the conviction is overturned. And then 2014, which is when I went down, that's when it had been declared a miscarriage of justice. justice. But only last year he got his apology from the commissioner. And was that on the basis of the declaration of the miscarriage of justice and the conviction being overturned? Was that on the basis of what happened to him in custody and how that confession was taken out? You know, obviously they decided with all this that the confession that he gave was false. Well, they must have. Well, yeah, they must have. Yeah. Mm. Now, it, well, and also I imagine they went back over the rest of the evidence that wasn't there yeah. ever in the first place, you know, and they did like there were a lot of witnesses from the original case that were called back. You know, a lot of stuff was revealed in that appeal through mm-hmm. those, you know, those subsequent court dates. Including that witnesses were encouraged not to give certain evidence that they had and yeah. to maybe take a certain road. Yeah. I mean... It's hard to imagine that that happened in Ireland, but of course, you know, there is a lot of um, discomfort around the activities of that of heavy that gang. particular group. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we have the other two big cases that we're all very familiar with. We have the Kerry Babies case and we have the Salons Train robbery, um, which involves the same group of Gardaí and same claims and allegations of coercion. and let's call it what was physical abuse, Mm -hmm. you know, um, that where confessions were extracted, you know, that were later found to be uh, not true, Mm. that that were later to be, and which families and those accused always found, always claimed that they had been literally beaten out of them. Mm. And I mean, that's a tactic that is used still in certain countries in the world that they will go in. It's usually countries, by the way, who boast that they have like a, 
100% conviction rate in murders. You always yeah, and they did have great success. Well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you yeah. know, how is your conviction rate so yeah. incredibly high? Well, clearly because, and I think what the mindset of it is that they will sit down and they will decide on a scenario and how a murder happened and who is responsible. Mm. And they will make everything fit that mm. box then, as opposed to good detectives will always say to you, you have to keep an open mind, even if mm. you're looking at a, a case, a murder case, and you're you, you're just seeing a clear picture of what happened. Mm. They will still say, got to keep an open mind, got to, you know, that's that's really at the heart of good detective work. I think you also have to th- remember the time it was, I suppose, as well, and why they were given the powers that they were given. It was the height of the IRA. Yeah. And, you know, we were experiencing attacks here in the South as well. And, you know, there were certain sections of the Guardi that were given special powers or, you know, a couple of... Art blanche, really, yeah, to go and to kind do what of they had to do. What, do what they had to do to keep the country safe. Mm-hmm. And just, it seems like they took some of those powers, you know, into other, you know, areas where, you know, perhaps they shouldn't have. And a couple of years ago, there was a series on RTE called Crimes and Conve- yeah. Confessions, an excellent documentary series, which was set against this background of what was going on then. And it looked at the case of the Salins trains robbery. Mm-hmm. It looked at the case of Una Linsky and of the Kerry babies. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it showed that sort of violent coercion, the involuntary confessions and the the intimidation that went on, the allegations of it. Uh, it focused in on that heavy gang. And I think really it called for, without having to say it directly, an independent inquiry into their activities. It's not too late. It's not too far back in our past. This really was uh, something that we are eventually going to have to face down. Amazing that we haven't so far. And even in this case, while the Garda Cold Case review team basically are are tasked now with investigating the murder of Una Linsky. Yeah. Do they also investigate the heavy gang and their activities. And, well, and that's them. It's a two prong. Like that's what they're saying. They are going to investigate the investigate the original investigation. So, you know, the Irish Council of Civil Liberties have already come out and said that they don't think that's appropriate. Mm. Um, you know, like there's been a, a few commentators already who said, well, how's that going to work? Because, you know, um, the guy who's the, the detective inspector who's in charge of the cold case review team mm. has said that, um, you know, that it's not going to be a witch hunt, that the officers involved aren't compelled to appear in front of them, but that he would hope, you know, that everyone will cooperate as fully as they can. And already, you know, whenever any of these guys have been questioned before, they have vehem- vehemently denied that they used any kind of physical force. Martin Comey spoke about that, you know, mm. during one of his trials, you know, watching some of those guys who he claims beat him senseless and pulled out his hair in clumps. And he has described watching them kind of sitting there very coolly and calmly in court, telling them, no, I didn't touch him. No, he was fine. He did all of this on his own, you know. He's saying that they have, you know, already lied under oath. Well, yeah, Yeah. that's what he has claimed. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. And then, you know, you know, particular members of that squad have repeatedly said that there was no such thing as the heavy gang, you know, that it's just some fictional thing that the media have made up and that it's all, you know, nonsense, that they just did the job to the best of their ability. Mm. I mean, Jerry O'Carroll is a prominent member who's still <laughs> alive and who was a columnist for the Evening Herald newspaper for a long time, who um, was at the heart of the Kerry Babies scandal and who persistently, even in the face of scientific evidence, stuck to his his guns that those two babies were from the same mother but different fathers and that that was a possibility. Yeah. Um, and obviously Joanne Hayes at the centre of that case eventually received an apology, but it took a long time to extract it from the state. Yeah. And her family um, all ended up, you know, giving statements that they said that were coerced. Totally. For quite from them. From them. Under very extreme. I mean, she was not the mother of that murdered child. And of course, that case has recently developed and that the parents of that murdered child have been identified. Mm -hmm. And that case, again, certainly in the media has gone slightly cold. Um, We haven't heard what more can be done with it. Mm -hmm. It's still a murder investigation that may be washed up on a beach with them. 
an unbelievable amount of stab wounds and sort of, you know, discarded in 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 some farm bag for manure or something like this. Yeah. Um, And all the while. The wrong woman. Was torn apart by the, yeah. by the state, her activities, her her sexual liaisons, which were her own business, completely and utterly. She was treated appallingly. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it took decades to get an apology. But what struck me in that case in particular was she wrote a book at one stage, yeah. Joanne Hayes, and they sued her. Yeah. Some guardy from the heavy squad, the heavy gang, sued her mm-hmm. and they got pay- a payout and the book was pulped. Yeah. <laughs> and and that to me is still such an injustice that that happened. Yeah. Um, And that's it. Like, you know, you're never... You, it's of interest. I'm curious about what they think that this review is going to do, you mm. know, because they've already, you know, said to us that, you know, that they see no problem with themselves, you know, doing this review, you know, whatever about the actual Unalinsky's, you know, murder. And that would be fantastic. Like, you know, what that would bring to their family to finally know what happened to her. Mm. But the other side of it, you know, the actual investigation and what led to poor Marty Kerrigan's death that's that's a different thing altogether. Mm. That was sparked by, you know, it, it's claimed that that was sparked by certain behaviour. Which divided a community which, and, and which destroyed created a community. And created yeah. all that hatred, neighbour against neighbour, yeah. cousin against cousin. Um, the Gar- In fairness to the Garda Serious Crime Review Team, which was established, I think, in 2007, 2008, to investigate Ireland's 202 unsolved murders. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. The brain on me, eh? But anyway, um, no. It's in here. The big brain. But anyway. um, HRT. They have had to go back and find a way to go over other police work that was done in the past. And they've always had to find a way to tread into that because it's sometimes not so easy to come in, you know, it's seen still some some of the cases down the country. Here's this crowd yeah. from Dublin questioning what we did. Yeah. Because a lot of the murders, the the detectives at the time did their damnedest, yeah. did their best. Sometimes they may have missed something. Yeah. Sometimes it is to do with the development of scientific, you know, progress around evidence, around DNA and all that, that will help solve it. But sometimes there was human error there. Yeah. And to kind of go back then, I suppose, and fix that and, and try and culminate it in a in a conviction yeah. and the solving of a case uh, is something that they've had to find a way to do in a gentle fashion. Yeah. So they are used to going back and questioning detectives, but I don't believe from the point of view, yeah. most of that, certainly any of them I've spoken to in, in cases, most of it anything that has maybe been missed has been human error. Mm -hmm. We all make mistakes. We're all capable of making mistakes, of missing things. Mm. How they'll tread back into this. 52 years. Yeah. And, you know. And, you know, there won't be that many left to question. And a lot of members of that original heavy gang are But it's still worth doing. Oh, it's still worth doing. Like it has to be, you know, like we, because you said it at the top there, you know, it's something that people have kind of skirted around almost mm. because it, it's so uncomfortable. It's so uncomfortable. And because, you know, there are other people who did good work within those factions. And, you know, a lot of that has been overshadowed now mm. by these super, you know, miscarriages of justice. But we do need, you know, for all of those people. And like, it's the thing that we in our work kind of like, you know, encounter again and again. It doesn't really matter how long you know, it takes or what it takes. But for people to finally feel vindicated, it means everything. Absolutely. And I mean, I think even recognising the sins of the past Mm. is cathartic in some way. Um, And it all kind of goes to, you know, to that, you know, hope that it won't happen again. Yeah. I think nowadays things are so different. There is so much, you know, accountability within the Guardi, which is often a cause of, uh, you know, discontent among the Guardi. But like the idea even like, I, I was, because I was writing about it this morning and like that idea of those three lads been taken in yeah. and like staying there for as long as they did with no one on their side, no one coming in and going, you can't do this. And you think of the utter, like, you know, 
wastrels Error. that yeah. come in and, you know, get let go after however many hours because they know their rights and they have, yeah, yeah. you know, solicitors are coming in to get them out. And there's, you know, the limitations that are there now in questioning people, which is right in the human rights that they have. And everything's and recorded and everything's now. Recorded, and yeah, of course, you yeah. know, we're in a completely different place now to the way it was then. That's not to say we just go on, carry on regardless and mm. ignore it and don't tackle it and navel gaze at it and just yeah. think, this was really, really bad. This was really bad. Yeah. And, it's, you know, the Guardi. So the big question, I suppose, is we've talked about the Guardi Serious Crime Review team investigating it. it there's calls for a completely independent yes. body, for a kind of an inquiry, a tribunal of inquiry. Should yeah. there not be a tribunal of inquiry into the activities of the heavy gang? The heavy gang. Well, y you wonder, given, you know, that... <laughs> because the, the, these were people that were also empowered by politicians mm -hmm. and by, you know, management. And yeah. No, they didn't go off and do it on the, off their own bat or anything. Like they, they were had given a power that yeah. was just... They had permission. Yeah. So, you know, a full public or independent inquiry mm -hmm. into this, it might cost a lot of money, but it does seem that surely it's the most obvious step and surely it isn't satisfactory that the Garda Series Crime Review team have been left with it. Yeah, I think that, you know, while it's always, I think like the, the that the idea that Una's murder, you know, is going to be gone back over and miracles happen, you mm -hmm. know, and DNA is extraordinary. And look at what's what, you know, we've been able to unearth in just, you know, the last two or three years. But throwing in the other side of it yeah. on top of it, I think was not the world's best idea. It wasn't not a good idea. Yeah. I think it's kind of um I think it's going to infuriate, you know, you know, if, if they sit down and think long and hard enough about it, I think it's going to infuriate those that it's supposed to be helping. But I mean, it's a political will to give a public inquiry. Yeah. And that political will obviously isn't there for whatever reasons. And there's been plenty of voices. There's all sorts of other cases, though, in the past that just never go away. Yeah. And they just keep coming back up, like the murder of Father Niall Malloy and all the circumstances around that. And really, when you don't, you're not open and transparent, then it it sort of leads to all these conspiracy theories as well in the background and the ether um, that continue. And there's there's relatives. I mean, these cases may have happened in the past, but there's younger relatives even who will be impacted. Of course. Yeah. I mean, only recently, no long. Yeah. Nora Sheehan was the coldest murder case in Ireland. She it was 42 years unsolved and no long had originally been put on trial. And due to a series of, you know, misfortunate events, the, 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 the death of two key people within the inquiry, the trial was he was acquitted at the time. Mm -hmm. And it's only in recent years because the Garda Series Crime Review Team went back and looked at it. He was then brought before the courts and convicted of right. pleaded not guilty, mm -hmm. but was convicted. Um, but we've been working on a kind of a longer term podcast on that. And we've been delving into the effects of it. Mm -hmm. And it's just like dropping a boulder into the middle of a pond and the ripples keep coming and coming yeah. and coming. Generation after generation after generation. The murder of Nora Sheehan affected her children. Yeah. Which affected their parenting. Yeah. Which affected the lives of what would have been her grandchildren, mm. which affected their parenting relationships and all the rest of it. It just keeps coming. Mm. Well, we were speaking even before we came on here, like the other... Um, I suppose a big one that I worked on was the Joe O'Reilly case. And, yeah. you know, that that was another, you know, element of that. Like people often wondered how his family could have stood by him as, as you know, strong as they did. Now some families are going to do that anyway. But he had had a, a very interesting um, part, a, a, you know, miscarriage of justice in his past. An uncle, his mother's brother, was accused of killing, I think, his landlady. But it was later found that he wasn't and that he spent time in jail. And as a result... It's, you know, I was told and I've heard that the O'Reillys just didn't trust the justice system. And why would they? Because they had had that horrific, like going to jail. Is, going to jail for no, something you didn't do. And going for, like it must be. Your liberty denied for something you didn't do. And nobody listening to you, nobody believing you. Yeah. And a concerted and, effort by individuals in power to actually, mm -hmm. you know, blame you yeah. in the wrong. Why would you be, why would you trust anyone or anything exactly. you know, after that? Exactly. Like that, those are the, and like, you know, then you kind of, you like he was able to use that to his advantage, mm. you know? So yeah, all those ripple effects that happened. And sort of Una Linsky then from your, 
your your time there and you know amidst that community and stuff um was her murder almost it must have been completely and utterly covered in in all this stuff that went on in the aftermath or you know do you need to peel back those layers of the mistrust and the devastation of the community before you can get to what happened because let's look at that for a minute mm -hmm. she gets off a bus in a country area yeah witnesses see a woman with dark hair struggling in the back of a car, what looks like a man trying to kiss her perhaps in the mm -hmm. back of the car and somebody driving. Two months later, her body is discovered up in the Dublin mountains. Um, we don't know whether she was sexually assaulted or how she died, but if that scenario is something that you can work on, you suspect that she might have been both mm -hmm. those things. And whoever, if that, those witness, um, those witnesses are correct and saw what they saw. Somebody got away with murder and somebody got away with a horrendous crime. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, and that's it. And, you know, there there are, a, like, you know, not a small, inconsiderate group of people who have known that for mm. 52 years. Uh, they have known that no matter what efforts they made to kind of do their best to make sure that poor Una's, you know, killers were brought to justice. Yeah. It was, you know, ignore, you know, you know, maybe taken on board for a short week or two, but then dismissed. And then, you know, they tried, you know, they were told to change it. And did they never, ever in all the time come back to that original sort of moment that she disappears off the side of the road? Was there ever any other suspect, any other, Possibly. anyone identified in the whole? No, not that I've. Not that we not, know of, not basically. That know of, not that I've read of or, mm. no, not that I've heard of. So that's obviously yeah. going to be something that the cold case mm. review team will be concentrating on. And maybe in the bundles of documents, of statements that were taken, there will be something that will lead them to, yeah. to that. Yeah. You just hope it's all there. Mm. And, you know, they've had success, though. Yeah. They have had success. And also, to point out, these things take a long time. Oh, I mean, yeah. some of these cold case reviews can take up to 10 years. There's going to be no quick answer to this. Gosh. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. I think we're sort of in agreement there should be a full independent inquiry. Yeah, okay, yeah. sure. Into the heavy gang and their activities. Yeah. I think really, honestly, we you know, we should be looking at that in the 70s and the 80s. And I'm afraid I don't know much about that Salins uh, case. But I do know that as a child, my mother Kelly. reefed me out of a um, march on the road where I was marching with a group of Republican yeah, yeah. soldiers with a flag, an Irish flag, and it was a free Nikki Kelly march. Where was that? In my, like where I grew up. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. wow. Yeah. There was a kind of a Republican element that okay. lived in the area and they organised this march. I hadn't a clue who Nikki Kelly was. Well, it was always I do remember the graffiti. The graffiti on, on the... On yeah, in 11, is it? 11, yeah, free Nikki Kelly. Across. And, and somebody wrote years, with every box of cornflakes, yeah. Kellogg's cornflakes. But he was innocent. He was innocent, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But that's that was my memory as a child, you know, and I sort of remember my mother looking out and just being like, what, what is doing? she doing in the middle of a march? She with have, yeah, sort of she should have known then that you were going to cause her an awful lot of heartache. Exactly, you know? exactly. But yes, I must I must read up on the details of the yeah. of the Salins case because another miscarriage of justice and people being jailed and the same individuals from that heavy gang involved in those interrogations. Same names keep popping up. Same names yeah. keep popping up. Yeah. yeah. OK, Jenny Freel, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.